thank you for tuning in today. My name is Arlene. I'm here with Dan, and we are ready to worship with you. And we have two songs for you, and we pray that we would make a joyful noise unto the Lord because he is worthy. Amen. The king of my heart be the wind. 
never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down Amen. Praise God, everybody. That was awesome. Awesome praise and worship. I'm grateful for those that continue to come out and uh, lift up the name of Jesus and allow us to worship and enter into his presence, either by ourselves or with our family. And I want to strongly encourage you that while you're sitting at home watching this, don't just listen to the music. Don't fast forward by the music. Enter in and sing those songs unto the Lord, for God is great and he is greatly to be praised. Amen. Um, before I start to the message, I just want to take a moment to give thanks for everybody that is continually, faithfully supporting the church. I want you to know how blessed I am, how encouraged I am, um, and how proud I am that our church continues to faithfully give. And man, that is a, a, a huge burden off the back of the pastor and of those in the board, so I want to thank you for that. I also want to once again thank those that have come and put a ribbon around our pillars by the front door and put your family name on it. I can't tell you how important that is and how much it means to me. Every single time I pull up into this church and I walk through those doors, I stop and I look at those pillars and I see those names uh, of those family members and families who come and let us know, Pastor, we're here for you, we're here for one another, we are part of this body, and if you have not yet put your name on a ribbon on one of those pillars, I want to encourage you to do so. Because if you're part of this body, if you're part of this church, Praise God, your name should be out there with everybody else's because it's a sign and a symbol of unity. So I'm so grateful and so thankful that you encourage me. Just like those signs that somebody put in the driveway, that encourages me every time I pull in. Um, and those uh, ribbons, those encourage me. And that's how you minister to your pastor. And that's how you minister to those of us that are working here in the church. It means a lot. So I want to thank you for that. Um, open up your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Ephesians. We're going to start in chapter 4. And the title of our message is Bodybuilding. <clears throat> now, I know those of you that are watching, you're looking at me right now, you're saying, well, obviously this is something this guy knows a lot about. So, you know, you're right. I do know a lot about what I'm about to say. And bodybuilding is important because we all know that a strong body makes us stronger and able to endure more situations and to be able to endure more trouble. We all know that the stronger you are, the better you are able to handle some kind of attack, whether it be uh, a virus, whether it be a germ, whether it be some kind of sickness or disease. The stronger you are, the better you're able to withstand an attack. That's why in this COVID virus, those that were getting uh, struck the hardest by far were the elderly, because they were the weakest, or those that had co um, um, uh, compromised immune systems, because they were the weakest. But the youngest, you know, they were uh, hardly having any um, damage to their body. Why? Because their bodies were strong. So it's important to have a strong, strong body. So that's why the title of our message is bodybuilding today. But of course, as you probably imagine, I'm not talking about lifting weights. I'm not talking about going to the gym, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things. Go right ahead, and I want some of you to feel free to go to the gym and do a couple sets on my behalf, okay? Praise God. Feel, feel free to do that. I'm talking about building the body of the church, the church body. Because it's just as important. In fact, I would say, change that. It's far more important to build the church body 
than it is to build your physical body. Because the Bible actually says this. The Bible says that bodily exercise profits but a little bit. Meaning, yeah, you can work out, you can get in shape, it's going to help you physically, and it's going to help you endure different things. But White says it's limited because it's comparing it to the condition of the spiritual body. Because it's the health and the strength of the spiritual body that will profit you for eternity. It'll profit your family for eternity. So yes, bodily exercise does provide you with a, a benefit, but it's little. But the spiritual body, the health and strength of the spiritual body has a much, much greater benefit and a much, much long-lasting benefit, okay? So bodybuilding is vital and it's important. And I want to encourage you because I am very concerned about the condition of the body of the Church of Jesus Christ. I'm very concerned because the body has been under attack from the enemy for years now. Now, you may say, well, everything looks good to me. Well, that's kind of like, you know, these houses that are on the beach or something like that on the coast, and they look good. The foundations look good. But all of a sudden, a storm comes in, and that same house that had that same foundation, which looked good the day before, guess what happens to it? It completely collapses, and it falls into the ocean. Because it may look good when the sun is shining, but when a storm comes, when a difficult time comes and hits it, man, that, that, that foundation that looked good, that looked strong, may not have been strong enough. And I'm saying this because the Lord has been laying in my spirit for the last couple of messages now to start speaking and preaching prophetically towards the future and what's going to come. A couple of Wednesdays ago, I, I, I preached about um, the road to Sodom, that that's what's coming. This past Wednesday, um, I preached about Babylon rising because that's where we're heading and that's what's coming. And I want to preach to you right now about the importance of the body, of the strength of the body of Christ, because hard times are going to come for the church. Storms are going to come for the church. And we need a strong body in order to keep us strong. Our children, listen to me, our children are going to need a strong body around them to keep them in the faith. Do you hear what I'm saying? We are living in prophetic times right now. And I'm telling you, the, the storms that we're seeing in the streets around us, they're going to uh, keep continuing to simmer and stir. And the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, is going to come under heavy attack. And if we're not body strong, a lot of people are going to fall away. And I'm concerned about that. Because our great strength that we have as the body of Christ does not lie in our individuality, it allows in our unity and our community. And as I said just a few moments ago, I'm concerned because the enemy has been attacking the body of Christ for years now. But what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, it, it, hasn't the enemy always been attacking the body of Christ? Yes, but he's been winning the battle in recent years. First of all, as you've heard me say in the past, I mean, the church of Jesus Christ has just grown weaker and weaker. It's growing more and more lukewarm. But what I'm really talking about right now is that over the last decade or so, the body has been growing weaker and weaker because the, the church, because the individuals who are part of the body, have failed to recognize the importance of the body. We fail to recognize that. You know, there was a time when I first got saved, and, and that wasn't that long ago, there was a time when we got saved where when it was time for church, we did everything in our power to get in those church doors. There was nothing that could stop us from going to church. I don't care what it was. We had to be there. And I'm talking back in the day, I'm talking four services a week. We went to the house of God to hear the word of God, to worship God, and to fellowship with each other. That's how it was back in the day. And, that, and when we had that body strength, the church grew. And great things were happening in the church. But the church doesn't do that today. Nowadays, any excuse, and people miss the house of God. Any excuse whatsoever. It could be a family party. It could be a sporting event, one of any sporting events. It could be a school event. It could be a town event. It could be anything. And it comes before the house of God. And I know that, oh, you're saying, but, you know, we're good people. My family's good people. Listen to me. 
listen to me, a storm is going to come. And all of a sudden, we're going to be under heavier persecution. Our children are going to be under heavier persecution than ever before. And one day, we're going to wake up and we're going to say, oh my God, how did this happen? I didn't see this coming. How did this happen to my children? I said last Wednesday, when I was uh, teaching on Babylon Rising, I said there are going to be tens of thousands of parents, I prophesied this, there's going to be tens of thousands of parents who are going to wake up one day and say, oh my God, what happened to my family? Oh my God, what happened to my kids? How do they become this way? How do they make these wrong turns? How do they become so violent or so extreme? How do they cast off their faith so much? How did this all happen? Because we're going to be confused. Because we're going to think, oh, I gave them a good neighborhood, a white picket fence, a, a good school system. I did everything I could for them, and I provided everything, and we didn't understand the importance of the church body. We didn't understand that, because that went from number one on the list to the last thing on the list. And we thought, oh, by giving them a good picket fence by, uh, and a good neighborhood and a good school system, that that's going to be good enough for them. No, it's not. Not with the storm that's coming. A storm's coming. We see it in the streets today starting to stir. The storm is coming. It's going to get harder and harder for your children to be able to serve God. It's going to be harder and harder for the average Christian to be able to stand up and just speak their faith like they could have only a couple of years ago because we're going to be persecuted. We're going to be attacked. We're going to be called haters. We're going to be called bigots and racists and, and all kinds of prejudiced things. That's what we're going to be. And Jesus said this to the early church, to his disciples. He said, people will hate you for my namesake. And we're going to start seeing that. And if we don't have a strong church body, if we don't have a strong church community, many people, starting with our children, are going to fall away. They're going to drift away. And they're going to lose their faith. And they're going to get caught up in the doctrines of devils of this world. And they're going to be deceived and deluded. We need to have a strong body. What kept the church of Jesus Christ together and caused them to flourish and grow in the midst of intense, horrible persecution was the unity in the body, was the strength of the body, was the community. A commune with unity is the community of the body. In other words, we were there for each other. They were there for one another. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But I want us to understand the importance of the body of Christ. It's not just a cliche. And we're entering days where we're going to start understanding, wow, I really needed the body of Christ because look what's happened to my faith. Look what's happened to my family. Look what's happened to my marriage. You see, another reason why I'm especially concerned about this, this is it's no longer the enemy attacking with school programs and sports programs and, and everything else on Sundays. Remember, Sunday was sacred unto the Lord for uh, 2,000 years. Even only a decade or two ago, Sunday was sacred unto the Lord. There was no such thing as high school sports or town sports on Sunday. It was sacred. All of a sudden, like this, it's gone. And the church fell right into it. So Sunday has been robbed. The foundation of our faith has already been robbed. Well, let me tell you another thing that I'm very, very concerned about. That's only going to add to the erosion of the foundation of our faith. Many of us have heard talk about um, what's going to come after this pandemic. Many of us have heard talk about that. Many businesses, many offices have discovered, oh, guess what? We don't need to actually go to work to do our work. We don't have to rent this 5,000 square feet of office space. We've discovered that we could do our work at home. So you know what? We're going to stay home for now on and do our work and still get paid and run our business. That's already happening. Thousands of companies are already making those decisions. They're already making those plans. Well, guess what? Thousands or tens of thousands of Christians are already thinking the exact same thing. They're thinking, hey, man, you know what I discovered? I don't have to get up on a Sunday morning and go to church. I could just get up whenever I feel like it. I could just watch church whenever I feel like it. In fact, I could watch 10 churches whenever I feel like it all throughout the week. And man, that's great, man. That's good. See, I'm still a Christian. And so therefore, the church is going to suffer even more. Because the church of Jesus Christ was never intended 
to be lived through live stream. It was never intended for that. Remember what Holy Communion is. Holy Communion is the body of Christ coming together. Okay, remembering, putting the members of the body back together again. Two weeks ago, I talked about the danger of culture. Well, Christianity is a culture. Well, the second C I want to talk about today is that Christianity is a community. We need to understand that. The stronger the community is, the stronger the church is. The weaker the overall community is, the weaker the church is. I've shared this many times, what I'm, what I'm about to say, only because it's so true, that it's been such a blessing for me to hear over the years of when my daughter and my son and, uh, and, and Laura Nicole and Carly and Sarah and, and many others have shared, oh, wow, man, as, as I was going out through my teenage years into my early 20s, what kept me in the house of God was my relationships and my friendships with other Christians in the house of God. That's what kept me there. And that blesses me. But you know what? It also scares me because this new generation has come up and they couldn't care less about relationships. In fact, they say, oh, I don't know anybody in church. So therefore, why go to church? And so therefore, our youth group, you know, struggles to even keep going and keep its doors open. No, we should be obsessed. Parents, listen to me. Families, listen to me. Kids, listen to me. We should be obsessed with bodybuilding, with building the body of Christ because it's going to be important for us. We're going to survive in it. Here's a revelation that God just spoke to me right now, this second. We need to look at the body of Christ the same way Noah looked at the ark. Noah didn't just randomly, you know, throw, <laughs> throw a couple pieces of wood together and then pop a sail on it and say, well, you know, we'll just ride this storm out. No, Noah took an ark and it was a huge ark. He put pitch on the inside of it, pitch on the outside of it. He made sure that that thing was watertight and water sealed because he knew when the storm came, the only thing that is going to keep us afloat and keep us alive and give us a hope and a future is that we're safe inside of that ark. So therefore, he went to the extreme to build a strong ark. Well, don't you realize that the church of Jesus Christ is the ark today? Don't you understand a storm is coming? It's already on our shores. Don't you understand that? We should be obsessed with building the ark or building the church of Jesus Christ to keep it strong so we find shelter and safety for us and our families, our children, and invite our friends and invite our, co our, our co-workers into that ark because the storm is going to come. I promise you, as I said, watch the news and you could tell the storm's already here on our shores, but it's going to get worse. Go back to last Wednesday and listen to the message, Babylon Rising. It's going to get worse. And our protection against the storm is the ark. Or for us, our protection against the storm is the church. We need to make the church strong. We need to build the body of Christ. You know, when the storms weren't as severe, you can kind of be a, a hanger on her. Um, oh, yeah, I'm part of the church, but I just kind of hang on the outside. When the storm comes, guess what? You're not going to make it. When the wind blows and the rain hits, you're not going to make it just hanging on the outside. You need to be on the inside. So I'm begging you from my spirit. I'm begging you from the spirit of God. I'm seeing the future. I'm seeing what's going to come. And we can either ride out the storm together in the bottom of the boat with Jesus. Remember that story. We can ride out the storm in the ark where we make it big enough for anybody to fit or we could struggle on the outside. Let's build the body. Let's build the ark of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16 says this, and I want to read it from the NIV because it's easier to understand. Speaking about the body, it says, from him who's Jesus, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, and it grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The body of Jesus Christ holds itself together. We need each part to hold itself, and it says for each, when each part does its part, we're drawn together. In the, King, in the King James, it also uses the word compacted together. 
meaning we're drawn tight together. We are unified together and fitly framed together. Fitly framed means like, you know, you build a wall of block out there and you can't slide a piece of paper between the two blocks. There's no way for the enemy to come in and get in and bring destruction because we're fitly framed together. And we build one another, we encourage one another, or we provide strength for one another. That's what the Bible says. We're fitly framed together. Read that again. From whom the whole body, that's us, the body of Christ, were joined and held together by every supporting ligament. All our joints are held together by ligaments. And we grow and we build ourselves up in his love as everybody does our part. And that's what it says. It says, as each part does its work. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. That person sitting next to you needs you. We're all ligaments. We're all joints. We're all bones. We're all held together. We're fitly framed together. It's how the body grows and stays strong. And again, prophetically, I'm telling you, we're going to need it more than ever in the last days. In Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 21 says this. It says, in whom all the building is fitly framed together, grows unto a holy temple in the Lord. 22 says, in whom we are also built together for a habitation of God, where God inhabits or God lives within us. But we are fitly framed together and that causes us to grow. How many of us want the body of Christ to grow? Amen. I'm sure every hand's up. If not, it should be. How many of us want this church to grow? Man, I do. I want it to grow. I want it to grow unto the Lord. Well, it grows when we are fitly framed together. As I said, as the body is joined together and united together more and more, tighter and tighter, it grows more and more. I'm going to read you some verses in a, in a few minutes that I read to you um, in the last couple of weeks that say the exact same thing. So Ephesians 2 tells us that as we're, uh, the more fitly uh, knit together we are, we grow, all right? Now I want you to see in Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 2, Verse 19, it says this, And not holding the head, who is Jesus, from which all the body by joints and ligaments, having nourishment, ministers, and knit together, increases with the increase of God. There it is again. As the body of Christ is knit together, is joined together, it increases through the increase of God. So we have two verses in a row that says the exact same things with only slightly different words. As we're fitly framed together, we grow. As we're knit together, we are increased or we grow stronger with the increase of God. How and when? When we are fitly framed together. That is super, super important. And again, I believe that overall the church of Jesus Christ has lost sight of this all-important aspect of Christianity. It is not just a little tiny doctrine. It's a major foundational doctrine. In fact, I would call it, if we're the body of Christ, I would call this doctrine the spine in the body from which everything else is joined to and keeps it erect and keeps it, it moving. So this doctrine is the spine of the body of Christ. And maybe that's why the body of Christ has become so spineless in its other meaning today, because we've lost the importance of the spine. We've lost the importance of what's keeping us held together and knit together and keeping us strong. And we're so easily drifted away onto other things that the world has to offer us. And we're getting weak. When we unite together, we go stronger together. In the book of Acts, and I'm going to start with chapter 8. Just one verse here. I'm going to go back to some verses I... Uh, read the last couple of weeks. Acts chapter 8, in verse 1 it says this, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and here's the part I want, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church. 
It doesn't say the church is being persecuted. It says there was a great persecution against the church. We're going to see a great persecution against the church. Did you not see in Washington, D.C., twice they attacked the church out in, front of the, in the White House? Twice they did it. And by the way, the liberal media mocked the president for defending the church and standing out in front of the church with the Bible in his hand. They mocked him. The church is going to be under heavy attack and heavy persecution. The founder of Black Lives Matter has already declared an attack on the church. All statues of Jesus should be torn down. All stained glass windows should be broken and ripped apart. He's already declared an attack on the church. These are the days that we're living in. We're living in the same days that the early church lived in. And you know I've shared this many times, man. When, when people got saved in the early church, they gave up everything for God. And they were hated by their family members, and especially because most of the early church was Jewish people. And if they decided to serve Jesus, they were cast out. They were cast off. Uh, they were considered dead. They lost everything. Yet somehow, through the midst of this hatred and persecution, to the point here where Saul, who later on became the Apostle Paul, where Saul's mission and goal was to completely destroy the church by imprisoning and killing Christians. That's how bad it was, and that's how bad it's going to get in the future. I pray that the Lord takes us away when that comes. But that's what's going to happen. And that's why we need to be strong. Well, how did the church survive? And not only survive, how did the church thrive through the midst of heavy persecution? Well, let's look at the foundation of the church upon which this persecution was poured on, okay? Turn back to Acts chapter 1. Again, I read these verses not too long ago, but man, they're powerful and they fit right now. This is the foundation of the church. This is the birth of the church when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church and they were baptized and uh, evidence of speaking in tongues, okay? This is the baptism of the church, the founding day, in essence, of the church. And notice what it says. Here's the key. Chapter 1, verse 14, verse, four, verse 14, and, it's, and previous it says, all of the apostles and the mother of Jesus Christ, Mary, was there too. And it says, these all continued with, say, one accord. In prayer and supplication, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. It started with unity. They were all together in one accord. They were united together. But let's just read a few more verses. Chapter 2. I read this not too long ago. I'm going to start in verse 42. Now, in verse 41, it says that 3,000 souls got saved. How many, you know, how is that possible that 3,000 souls can get saved in just one little preaching? God, how does stuff like that, stuff like that doesn't happen anymore? Well, maybe because the church isn't unified and as strong as it used to be. Because the stronger the church is, the stronger uh, the impact it has against evil and against darkness. So it says 3,000 souls got saved. And in verse 42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship, and the breaking of bread and in prayer, and prayers. And the fear of God came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Man, great things were happening, right? And all that believed were together. There it is again. And they had all things in common. In other words, they shared everything that they had. Everything. And they all sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. You want to talk about unity? And they continued daily with one accord. There it is again. In the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and, here it is again, singleness of hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, and then the Lord added to the church. Wow. So the church, in chapter 8, verse 1, was under great persecution. I mean, like I said, where Christians were getting thrown in jail, beaten, and killed. And yet they didn't fall apart. They didn't collapse. The church thrived. The church grew. The church multiplied. And what caused the church to multiply? Was the unity or the strength of the church. The early church practiced bodybuilding. That was vital to them. Because all they had was one another. That's why. All they had to survive was each other. 
And God moved through them. God poured his mercy upon them. God poured his grace upon them. And against odds that were overwhelmingly against them, they defeated the odds and they grew. Even a couple centuries later, when Rome was out to persecute and kill and torture every Christian they could find, guess what? The church still grew. The church still multiplied. How could such a thing happen? Because the foundation of the church was unity, was oneness, was community. They had all things in common. They understood that they needed to be there for each other. That's what they understood. And that's why the church under persecution didn't collapse. It thrived and it grew. I got to be honest with you right now. I don't know how the church of Jesus Christ would react today if the persecution got turned up a little bit more. In fact, I think I do know how it would react, and it wouldn't be good. Oh, I'll stay home and just watch it on TV or just watch it on my computer. This way nobody really knows that I'm part of that church or that I really believe. The church is so weak right now that it wouldn't take a major storm for most of the church of Jesus Christ to fall and collapse. My brothers and sisters, we need to lift up our spiritual weights and get the body of Christ back to being strong again. We need to make it a priority. We need to put it first in our lives because we're going to need it. Do you hear what I'm saying? We're going to need it. It's not going to be tomorrow like it was yesterday. It's only going to be worse. And we need each other. Ecclesiastes. Turn there. I'll get there eventually. Chapter 10. We went over this verse a couple weeks ago. I want you to see it because it fits perfectly with today's message. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8. It says, He that digs a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaks the hedge, a serpent shall bite him. You remember me sharing that verse a couple weeks ago? What does that mean? He who breaks a hedge, the serpent shall bite him. Well, if you remember, I talked about a couple weeks ago that the job of Adam in the garden and the job of the church today, and especially fathers today, is to build a hedge of protection around his family, but also around the city of God, which is the church, around the house of God. It's a hedge. It's, in, in this case, it's like made up of, of thorny bushes. It's a hedge, and it keeps the enemy out. Well, God warns, he who breaks the hedge, who causes an opening in that hedge, is going to bit, get bit by the enemy who's outside that hedge waiting to come in and bite and bring destruction. In other words, as long as the church is united, as long as the church is strong, as long as the church keeps a strong, consistent hedge around itself, the enemy can't get in. Do you understand? The enemy is not stronger than the church of Jesus Christ. The devil has lost. The devil is under our feet. Do you hear me? You don't have to be afraid of the devil. He should be afraid of you because of who lives in you and who you are. Do you hear me? Don't be afraid of the devil. He should be afraid of you. But how does the devil get strength? The devil gets strength when we break the hedge, when we, when we forget how important it is to be united together and we stop showing up at the body of Christ. And when we don't come, part of the hedge is open. And the enemy then can come in and bite those that are on the other side of the hedge. We need to keep the enemy out. And the way we do so is by being united together and joined together. We need to build the body. Almost done. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 5, God said, I was looking for someone who would fill in the gap, make up the hedge. In other words, he was saying the exact same important thing because God knew and everybody who lived in that day knew that they were under constant attack. See, it wasn't like you live today. Back in the day when you lived in a city, you were under constant attack, threat of attack from another city, from another nation, another group of people coming in. So you built walls or hedges of protection around you. 
and you knew and you understood the importance of that hedge. You couldn't allow a break or a gap to be in it because enemies would be able to just walk right through, whether they be animals or whether they be, you know, your, your neighbors who uh, are, you know, were out to destroy you. And God said, I'm looking for somebody to fill in that hedge, to fill in that gap. You know who God's looking for? You. He's looking for you. You have an important role in the body of Christ. You fill in a gap. You fill in the hedge. You keep the enemy out. You're protecting your children or somebody else's children. You're protecting somebody else's family along with your family and your marriage. You're protecting that weak person who just came to the Lord and, and just learning how to walk. You're protecting them because you're filling a gap in that wall. You're standing there and saying to the enemy, no, you're not allowed to come in. And he has to listen to you because of he who's in you. That's an important role that you have. But again, we so easily just don't show up. And we got holes and gaps in our hedges and our walls all over the place. And is it a wonder why the enemy is able to come into any church and just snatch sheep, young lambs, right out of them? How many parents are, oh, my kids aren't serving God. Oh, my kids aren't doing this. Oh, my family's not doing this. Oh, my marriage is destroyed. How could that happen? How could that happen? I'm surprised it doesn't happen more because we have so many holes that our hedges are broken down, our walls are broken down. We need to build them back up again because a greater attack is coming, I promise you. A greater attack is coming. And the only defense we have is to be in that ark when the storm comes, to be in the strong church. Last verse, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. We used to look at this verse as a command years ago. Now it's, eh, eh, who cares? But notice what the Word of God says because God knows what He's talking about. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as has become the manner of some, but instead, we need to be there to exhort and encourage one another. And notice what it says. And it's even more so as you see the day approaching. Did you catch what that just said? I'm going to read it again. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but we need to be there to encourage and uplift one another. And even more so... It's even more important as we see the day coming. Guess what? We could see the day coming. We could see it. So therefore, it's, uh, the Word of God says it's even more important. It was important for them 2,000 years ago. Guess what? The Bible says it's more important for us to be there together. Well, what do you mean when you see the day coming? Why is it more important? Because the storm is going to be worse that's coming. The storm on the horizon is going to be worse. And it's more important than ever that we be there to exhort one another, to encourage one another. You know, one of the worst things that has happened to the church is technology. Because it's kept people away from each other. Oh, I could just call my friend. I could just text a prayer. I could just watch something on TV or a video or an iPad. And all of a sudden, we're separate and we think we're connecting, but we're still separate. There's nothing like the body being joined together. Nothing like being there for each other and praying for one another, encouraging one another. Read your New Testament and find out how many times Jesus or the apostles touched somebody, physically touched them, and prayed for them, and raised them, and healed them, and lifted them up. It happened all the time. There's something important about a touch. God has anointed you, and God has put an anointing upon your ability to touch somebody and to speak into somebody's life. Now, if you, if you have no other choice but to talk to them on the phone, well, then obviously, by all means, go ahead and do so. But man, that doesn't compare to kneeling down next to somebody to sitting down next to somebody, to kneeling down next to somebody, and encouraging somebody, exhorting somebody, telling them it's going to be okay, I'm here for you. See, that's what the body of Christ was supposed to do. That's what they did 2,000 years ago in the midst of the storm, in the midst of great persecution. And as a result, it grew. There are tens of thousands of people, I'm going to close with this, there are tens of thousands of people out in the streets around us that are scared to death of what's to come. They're scared. And I'm not talking the 
coronavirus. They see, they, they see, they feel Babylon rising around them. They don't know it. They don't understand it. They have no idea what Babylon even means. But they feel it, and they're scared. Guess what? God has given you the solution for them. Come with me. I'll, I'll exhort you. I'll encourage you. Come on into the ark. Come on into the boat of the house of God. And there you will find healing, and there you will find hope. God's laid that upon my heart for our phrase, a new phrase for this church, a place to find healing and hope. Because that's what God has established us to be. A haven, remember our message a couple months ago? A safe haven, a fair haven, a safe haven. A place to find safety, hope, health. That's what God has anointed us to do and called us to do. But we will only be affected, effective as much as we are united and drawn together. If we continue to put everything else before the church, we're going to be a weak church. And therefore, we'll have weak results. But when we're a strong church, we have strong results. Church, I want us to be a strong church. I want us to have an impact. I want us to be an ark of safety when the storms get worse and worse and worse. And we won't be an ark of safety if we have holes all over the boat and the boat starts sinking. I need you. The body of Christ needs you. We need each other. Let's build the body. Let's be strong for one another. Let's be strong for the kingdom. Let's be strong for the world as they get terrified and look for a place to go. Amen? Let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord God. We thank you that you have called us, ordained us, anointed us, Lord God, to be that ark in these last days, to be that place of refuge, that place of safety, of health and hope and healing, Lord God. That's who you have called us to be. You have called us to be strong. Lord, you said in the Old Testament to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. Well, Lord God, I, I pray that the church, this church, because that's all I could really affect, I pray that this church would be strong, that we would once again rediscover the importance of body ministry, of body unity, of coming together and being there for each other. Because, Lord God, I, I fear what's going to happen to some of our loved ones and how we're going to lose them in these last days. Lord God, may a strong church produce strong results, and may this church be strong in you, exhorting one another, fitly framed together, growing in the Lord. Amen. Praise God, everybody. God bless you. I'll see you again real soon. Love you. Miss you. See you later. Bye-bye.